Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We are everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got a question from longtime fan of the show, Yuho Rutila. Hi, Mo and Sean. I think this situation comes up every, in every gamer's life. The board game shelf is full, and significant others starts to hint that you can make space on the shelf by selling some of the hard collected games. How do you go choosing the games to let go? Is it the time since the last on the table or the overall time on the table? Should I still spare the gem that gets played too seldom? Or how about games with personal bond or a signed game from a designer? Where do you sell your used or even shrink wrapped game? Friendly local game store, eBay, Facebook, other places? How do you decide the right price for the game? What if it's a collector's item? How do you find these things out? Any hints on the topic are welcome, as I am facing this very problem at the moment. Cheers, Yuho. All right, Yuho, we're going to try to hook you up here. So today is actually a follow-up to last week's topic, where we answered the first part of Yuho's question, which was in regards to choosing what to let go of. Now, if you haven't checked that out, you may want to go give that a listen before continuing this episode, since this is a follow-up. Don't worry, we'll wait. All right, time's up. You missed your chance to get, we're moving on. All right, now that you've taken the time to figure out which of your games you want to get rid of and you got a nice stack of games to clear from your collection, leaving you with a shinier, tighter, more streamlined game collection, it's time to talk about how to get rid of those games. Now, what I think I want to focus on the most here tonight, because I think this would be the most value for people, is on where to sell or trade your games with the goal of getting the most in return for them. This will include a look at how to value your games and set an appropriate price. To help us out with that, we've got a special guest on the show tonight, and she games. Deanna Tuzino will be joining us. She has a lot of experience valuing games, both from our Extra Life auctions held every year, as well as running a small business selling retro toys and games. Welcome, Deanna. Hey, guys. So before we get into valuing games, I first want to talk a bit about where to look to sell your games. What are the best places you've found over the years to try to get rid of geeky items like games? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind usually is eBay. Um, and there's a link there that you can drop in the chat if you want. So the thing with eBay is you don't want to just go in cold and start selling stuff because no one's going to buy off you. You want to build up an account. You want to have some feedback and you want to... Um, purchase some items first just so you experience the environment you know what the heck's going on so that's a good way to start uh another place that you can sell online is amazon mm -hmm. amazon allows you to sell new or used on in toys and games so uh i think they listed as collectibles for used items um now i haven't sold on amazon in about seven years and when i did it was on dot ca but i was looking into it and they added a new thing where there's a limit to be able to sell during the holiday season, if you don't already have enough feedback built up, you won't be able to sell during certain times of okay. the year. And also, again, you want to have a, a, an account on there, maybe just put out some cheaper items, some less valuable items to build up feedback. You're not going to get feedback from buying on Amazon, only from, from selling, whereas eBay, you're going to get it both ways, right? So um that's two places and then there's also for online there's the board game geek marketplace which mo knows a lot more about than i do all right so the best thing about using board game geek is that you are selling games to gamers right board game geek is filled with uh, alpha gamers right people who take the time to make a board game geek account take the hobby very seriously right and the people on board game geek know what games are worth and because of that, they are willing to pay premiums for things like out of print or rare games or collector's items or signed copies. Now, the bad thing about Board Game Geek is that they're gamers and they care a lot about their games. And because of that, they're very picky in regards to the conditions of the games they're buying. The thing is, on their marketplace, you do get to specify the condition in your listing. The thing is, on Board Game Geek, like seriously, be as clear as possible. Every little scratch, every fold, if you have a shrink wrapped game and there's a tear in the shrink, make sure people know that. 
Now, as long as you commit and give all that information, you're not going to have a problem. But just realize that many of the board game people searching the board game marketplace are collectors as well as gamers and are looking for collector level items. And that's actually a really important thing, both uh, on BGG Marketplace and as Dee said on eBay and Amazon, is uh, having some uh, sort of standing, right? If, if you're a newbie on BGG, no, no one's going to take you seriously. And mm -hmm. the same with eBay and the same with Amazon. Uh, unfortunately, if you're just trying to get rid of the, your first game for the first time, no matter where you go, you are going to have more difficulties yes. on those kind of sites. Yeah, you can't just go in and be like, hey, I got this copy of Fireball Island. Want to buy it for 160 bucks, and it's the first thing you've ever listed. No one's going to pay attention to you. Yeah, it's definitely unlikely, which may have been the problem with the um, – we had a question earlier who noted what do you do if um, – the, the person who had noted they tried to sell a game multiple times. Mm -hmm. If that was the first thing they ever tried to list it, that could have been the problem. You might want to start with some lower, like $10 value items just to build up a few packs. And then what Mo said about condition, it's important on eBay too. I find yeah. gamers in general, people that are buying games, are going to be super picky. It's, it's a, a character trait apparently. Yes. So you know, make sure you describe it very clearly, exactly what's there and exactly what state it's in, or else when people get it, they're going to be unhappy and then you're going to get negative feedback. So, um, But with all of the above, when you're selling online, you have to consider shipping, which can be a pain in the butt. Uh, so you're going to have to parcel it up take it to the post office, get it weighed, find out how much shipping is going to be so that you can put that in your eBay listing accurately. Uh, Amazon, I think, estimates a shipping amount on its own. Um, but then on top of that, you have to worry about insurance and potentially missing parcels. You, know, you might have bad actors that claim that they haven't gotten stuff when they have, or things can just go AWOL. So, I mean, that's all stuff you have to worry about when you're selling online. So then sometimes you're better off just selling locally, right? So you've got Kijiji for local. You've got um, Facebook groups now are really great. Locally, we have um, a couple of good uh, uh, groups where you can do buy and sell for games. And in all of those, I find that if you list multiple items for the, it's true online too with, with um, eBay, but even more so for in-person uh, trades, if you list multiple items, it's better. If you if you put four or five games up all at once in that buy and sell group, then someone is going to contact you and say, hey, I want to get all three of those. It's worth your time more to go out to McDonald's and meet that person if you're doing it all in one go. It's just better. If you're going to do it, do it all at once. And then the last one is uh, your FLGS. If you're lucky enough for them to offer consignment or maybe they'll buy directly off you for resale, um, that's another good option for local. Sorry, you need to speak up a bit more, or point at the mic. Apologies. Ryan says it sounds like you're walking around the room. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, but I've I've been trying to trying to ride it, uh, ride it, and, and just sort of keep it. So I did I did up the gain on the mic a little bit. I'm wondering if I should switch to the all around instead of the focus. Uh, I might might not hurt. Okay, um, that's what I'm thinking yeah. for the second half. So unfortunately, a lot of FLGSs don't handle consignment, and so that may be a limiting factor. It can be a great option if it's there, but it may not be an option at all, and uh, you want to make sure you, you're aware of uh, how they handle things, because if they're just doing it for the heck of it, they may not be willing to get you a decent deal or, or give any effort to uh, put, in, put into selling your game, and it might just sit there forever, not making you any money, even though it's off your shelf. The other thing, too, is some local game stores, especially when you get into uh, non-board game items, might be willing to buy things like magic cards, right? Collectible cards, uh, Pokemon cards, Hero Click, any of the collectible stuff, um, Keyforge decks. Local game stores are often willing to buy that stuff. And the other thing is check your local comic book store, especially with the, the Hero items, like Hero Clicks often sell there. And some of the kids' cards games, like they may not do magic, but they might do um, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. And Ryan's right, noticing so that uh, Board Game Bliss offers local consignment uh, there you and go. things as well. So just a quick audio check. Is this any better? Hey, guys. Can you hear me now? It's, yeah. Should be a little bit better. All right. We're going to have outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now that you know where you want to try to sell your game or games, what's the best way to try to find a fair price? What 
where do you list them at? How do you how do you have any idea how much to ask for these games? Because I'll say one thing you don't see is it almost never works where you just go make me an offer. It seems like as a seller, you pretty much have to put that out first. Well, again, the first thing you want to consider is what condition is it in. Your used game is not going to be worth uh, a new and sealed copy that's still in print, right? Is it is it available? Is it still in print? Can you go out and easily buy a new copy? Um, now you can figure out the MSRP on a game by looking at a site like boardgameprices.com, which aggregates pricing from several online stores. And you can click through and look at a couple different online stores, and then you can go, oh, okay, so I know the MSRP on that's $50. And about half of MSRP is a good rule of thumb for a used game, unless it's out of print or rare. Even if it's new and sealed, no one's going to want to pay full retail, again, unless it's out of print, right? So you got to plan to knock at least 5 or $10 off the price from the MSRP, even for a brand new game. Now, when you're trying to figure out prices for stuff that might be out of print, the first thing to keep in mind is Amazon is not a good source for that information <laughs> because third-party sellers can just put whatever crack a doodle idea they have they can say oh i've decided that this game is 300 dollars and it doesn't mean that it's selling for that much it just means that someone decided to list it for that much yeah. and the same can hold true at ebay as well which is why i'll get to that in a second but amazon is particularly bad for just having wacky prices so just ignore that for trying to sell for trying to set uh what dollar value you want to use and then you can look at ebay Again, this is your prime area to look for uh, out of print items or new and old, rare, whatever. What you do is you go in and you look at sold items on eBay. Um, you go into the left hand sidebar, you scroll down until it says show only and you check off completed items. And that will give you the data on what was sold and unsold. Don't check off sold items. that will only show you what was completed and sold. You want to see both so you get a good idea. And that info will go back for 60 days worth. Now, there are sites out there that will let you see the historic data for more than 60 days. And if you have something that's rare that when you're looking it up, you're not finding enough examples to get a good idea, it might be worth it. Um, but most of those you have to pay for to use those sites. Uh, a third party example is worth point and I think there's a free seven day trial you can use so that might be enough to get you by or eBay has an in house program now called Terra peak, which is available for free if you have a store with them for certain levels of sellers. Um, so basically you scroll through you look at the completed items, you get an idea of the average selling price. And again, you have to make sure it's in similar condition to yours. Your well-worn copy of the Dark Tower, which is missing all but one flag, is not <laughs> going to be worth the same amount as a pristine copy with all the pieces, right? All right. So looking at the Board Game Geek Marketplace, this is another place that, besides being a place to sell games, is a great place to see the current going marketplace, the current market price. Because as I mentioned earlier, the people on Board Game Geek know what games are worth and are usually willing to pay for those games. So this makes it a great place to shop for the prices that gamers are willing to pay. Now, the marketplace when you go to, it's really simple. You just look up the game and you can see the, the, the basic marketplace that shows like the top five items. You can click on it and get the detail and you'll see all the available copies of the game for sale by country, including then if you click through, you can start seeing the, uh, the condition and the current selling price. The one... Uh, problem with this is that there's no history, right? So you can only see what's currently listed up for sale right now and what people are asking for now with no actual indication what's been sold. So you might bring up um, whatever, Fireball Island, and there's seven copies for $400 because everyone just set their price over the person above them. And it ends up no one's actually bought a copy for 700 So you don't get that information. But generally, the board game geek users don't do that. And if you do see it, you'll bring it up and you'll see that one price that's usually crazy high and the rest are all pretty much around the same area. Now, this is where there's a site called Spielboy. If you go to Spielboy, this is a board game pricing utility that's ugly as sin, I will admit, that shows you historical pricing data on games listed in the Board Game Geek micro or Marketplace. So that is your best bet. 
is you find the game on Board Game Geek, you look in the marketplace and bring it up on Spielboy and you get all the history to see every copy of that game that's sold on the Board Game Geek marketplace since the beginning of time. And that is probably your best bet for finding a price because, again, most of the people on Board Game Geek know the values of the games. Or if they, they're the, honestly, the people who are probably setting the values of the games. They're the ones setting the current market price. Now, one thing you do need to be aware of uh, if you're if you are pricing things on Board Game Geek, these are gamers. These are yeah. not real people. <laughs> um, so, if you're going to be selling to your local Kijiji market, there may only be a couple of gamers in the area who yeah. are willing to pay gamer prices. Uh, your average Joe on the street is probably not going to be willing to pay collectors' prices, even if that's what the game may be worth to collectors. Yeah. So you have to be aware that your marketplace where you're selling may, you know, determine some of that pricing. Even if you mm -hmm. know that that you know sealed box uh, wow is, should be worth three hundred dollars, Joe down the street isn't going to pay that. Yeah, we've definitely seen that uh, with something we'll be getting to later, which is one of the alternatives for selling games, which is to auction them, where we will have a three hundred dollar game go for like twenty bucks. Because just no one cares that it's a collectible game. They're just like, hey, I spent 20 bucks. I got a cool game. If no one wants it locally, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's not even locally, right? Like, that's part of the problem with all of this is it is a free market. And fair market value is going to be based on supply and demand. If there's a ton of people selling the same game as you right now, you're probably not going to get good money for it. Whereas if there's very few copies, there's a better chance you can charge a bit more. But I strongly feel that it can be worth... Um, making less money and selling it locally because there's that pain in the butt factor yeah. because you can get the best dollar by, by selling it on eBay maybe, but it's going to take up the most time going back and forth and email answering questions. You have to pack it up. You have to take it to the post office. You got to worry about those missing parcels. And so when you're building your price locally, you can tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go a little bit lower than that. Also eBay is going to take off a, a chunk of commission. Yeah. Uh, PayPal is going to take off a chunk of commission. You sell it to a guy on Kijiji and they go give you 50 bucks at uh, McDonald's. Nobody's taking a percent off that. So mm -hmm. you, you got to factor that in too, right? So um, back to when you're coming up with your prices, uh, some items have straight up uh, price guides when you're thinking of magic cards, mm -hmm. collectible cards. Uh, the site that at least the local stores use is tcgplayer.com. So that covers like your Pokemon, Magic, pretty much any CCG you can think of. They use the median prices on there when determining what they might pay you if you're going to go in and sell cards. Yeah, from what I understand, that's pretty much the standard, at least in Canada. I don't know if this is true in the States, but at least for Canada, that is the site that everyone uses. And they do that so that they don't have to compete with each other. Like, honestly, if the, the we have two local game stores that are, are, I don't know, about 10 steps away from each other, which is a little ridiculous. And they both use the same pricing guide. So you go to the store you prefer. You're not going to get a better deal at one than the other in general. So, again, that, that factor that it might be more convenient for you to sell locally means you, you might pick a price that you're willing to settle for a little bit less. But then when you go to list that on Kijiji or Facebook, you're probably going to want to put a little padding there because people are going to want to barter you down. You're going to say, I want $50 for this item, and they're going to say 40 every time. Yeah, Facebook it, is terrible. Right. For that. No one's just going to say, okay, cool, 50 bucks. Like that almost never happens. So if you know you really want $40 for the game, ask for 45 or 50. Be prepared to haggle. Again, you're likely listing a bunch of items at once, and someone will say, hey, if I buy 40 mm -hmm. off, if I buy these four items off you, will you give all of them to me for $100? And you can say no too. Like don't be afraid to say no point. and to barter back and to say, yeah, the lowest I'm willing to go is X and have that lowest price already in your mind. Um, and then back online on eBay, it's a little bit different. If you're setting the opening bid on eBay, you might want to take a chance and go a little bit lower than the minimum you want because you're hoping to bid build interest and that folks will bid it up. So, I mean, you can play it safe and you can start your opening bid right where your minimum price is or you can cut yourself a bit below that and then you might find that you actually make a bunch more money. It's your call. Yeah, the biggest thing on eBay that you want to do is you want to spark a bidding war. You want two people to want that item, and then they start going against each other, and then they stop looking at other items and comparing prices anymore and only care about beating that other person. That, that's what you're hoping to have happen 
which can happen by starting if it's low enough if your yeah. price is just right people will probably just snipe it yeah right they'll just come in and bid at the very last second and the, they'll be willing to spend 20 bucks on it whatever but if you know it's worth 20 or 30 dollars and then instead you set it for 12 well you might get that that added interest but you're taking a chance it doesn't yeah. always pay off yeah, and one of the things you need to, to pay attention of, and, and you touched on this earlier about, you know, conditions of things especially, but when it comes to Kijiji or eBay, there will be people who will pester you to no end about every detail and aspect of that product. They mm -hmm. want to know if, hey, can you, you, you didn't take a picture of this particular angle and I saw a, a, a version of that product once that had a little bit of flashing on it and does yours have that or not and be aware that there is a uh, element of time that you need to sort of put aside to deal with people like this um, unless you're willing to just sort of shut them down and, and completely ignore that avenue of sale but there are a lot of people out there both on EG, uh, ebay and, and arcade who will want to come or you know if it's local uh, can we come by and look at that i want to double mm -hmm. check and see if that's really this and that and you know, there's a whole lot of hassle involved. Um, you, it's it's mu much like running a, a yard sale, right? There's all these people who mm -hmm. want to waste your time without necessarily even ever planning to buy the item. And that's probably one that, that this is intentionally not on our list. You do not want to sell your stuff at a yard sale unless you're just like getting rid of it. Like you don't care. Like it, it, instead of throwing it out, maybe. If it was in the flood. Then yeah. you can put it in the yard sale. You can put sale. it in the yard sale. Like, like, we've tried it, right? Like, I tried to sell collectibles at a yard sale, and we can kind of get away with it if you have, like, the one table of collectibles. But even then, people are going to walk up to your $50 item and go, I'll give you a nickel. Like, it's that bad. Yeah. And you got to keep an eye on it, because if it's new and sealed, they'll try and open it. I've yes. had that happen at yard sales. I yeah. I just about yeah. passed out. I'm like, get your hands <laughs> off that. And people like to walk away with the collectible items well, because you highlighted them as collectible, which is yeah. unfortunate. So, yeah, we do not recommend selling anything you actually want to get something value for, not at yard sales. If you got some junk to get rid of, sure. All right. So, so far tonight, we talked about selling your unwanted games, but there are other options. Uh, one I particularly like and often do myself is trading my games for other games. Now, this is a great way to both grow and curate your collection while trying to keep the overall size down. Now, here are some places you can do this at that I found uh, work really well. And the first, again, we're going to go back to Board Game Geek. Again, you go where the geeks are, right? You go where your market is. It's a location, location, location thing. Uh, we've already talked about this as a great place to figure out the value of your games, but it's all as a, also an option for selling. But one of the other features is you can go into your board game collection or into any game, whether it's marked as you own it or not, but you can go through their entire collection, the entire database, and just click for trade on anything you own that you're willing to trade with. And similarly, you can go in and go want in trade and click on a bunch of different games. And then from that, you can go to a game and click who wants games and trade. So if you have a game to get rid of, go on Board Game Geek, find that game, click on want and trade, and there is a list of people who want to trade you something for that game. Now, meshing those two up is a bit of an artwork, but it is a way to find people who are looking for your game. And sometimes those people might even be willing to buy it, right? So this might also be a way to find or someone who's just going to buy it outright. Now, another interesting feature, now this is something we hadn't really talked on earlier in the episode, is instead of selling a whole game, but selling a game for bits, right? Selling parts. And this is a great way to get rid of components you have from incomplete games. Like if you've got a copy of Hero Quest, it's worth a fortune. But if you just happen to have the doors from Hero Quest, those can be worth some money. So if you go on Board Game Geek, there are two more things you can click off. And one is has parts and the other is wants parts. So this is a great way to get rid of those leftover bits. So if you did have the flood, instead of throwing out the whole game, separate what's damaged from what's not. And then you can go on Board Game Geek and look and see if anyone wants the parts from those games. Yeah, that's totally viable. I've made tons of money on eBay, breaking games down and selling them by bits. I, I would wait until I tried to get like the full game, but if that didn't pan out, you can sometimes make more money by selling them piecemeal. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily recommend doing that, but yes, you could go buy a complete game and take it apart and sell the bits and make money in some cases. It has to be out of print or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, locally, Facebook has been fantastic for trading games with local games. Uh, there are two very 
active local groups just for Windsor, Windsor Essex, really. So it goes out to the county. And I got to say, Windsor's not that big, right? So uh, just just with the, the the law of averages or whatever, law of large numbers, I don't remember which law it is, but the fact that we have two here means probably most places have a Facebook group. Not only that, there's a Canada-wide board game, buy, sell, and trade group that I see people in all the time. And then I know there's a board game group that actually does trading the world over. I don't get that involved in that one because, again, shipping is a pain in the butt. But what I would do is stage. I would start locally, and I would post my games there for a week or a month. And then I would move up and go, okay, how about anywhere in Canada? Someone want this? Okay, anywhere in the world want this game. And, again, you got buy, sell, and trade. Now, once you get a trade, it's just a matter of talking to someone in Facebook chat, right? You just bring up Messenger. It's like, yeah, hey, I've got this. What do you have? What do you want? Now, cons are another great way to trade games and, and get new games and get rid of your games. And this can also be even just smaller gatherings, not necessarily cons. So pretty much every con, uh, I'll admit, I'm not a huge con goer. We only really recently started our con journey about five years ago. But every con I have been to has some form of trade system or barter system, a trading room, uh, a rare game auction or something. Something you can put your games into to get rid of. Now, locally, game stores often set up trade nights. And I noticed even uh, Pennywise in our chat was talking about how their local store has done this, where they have a trade night where people can get together. We try to do these, we we're trying to do them once a quarter before the whole pandemic thing hit. And we mix it up between board games and RPGs where we let people just trade their stuff, right? Uh, I think this is really cool. So one of the things you can do is check your local gaming meetups and see if they offer anything like this. Or if you have a local group that gets together, like a tabs or a... Or, or something like that, like a, a meetup group that gets together regularly, ask, like, hey, why don't we have a trade night sometime where we can swap our games, have, have some kind of swap meet? Yeah, and most of them have a pretty cool system there. Instead of people putting all their stuff out on the table and just trading items, you traded everything in for uh, coins, basically, right? Like yeah, tokens. Uh, po poker chips, tokens. So, you know, a uh, core book is worth X, a module is worth X, because we did it with our RPGs mostly. Yep. And you would get your pile of tokens, and then we would roll to see who had initiative, and you would take turns picking what you wanted off the table with your tokens. And that was a neat way to be able to trade up and not have to, you know, Sally didn't have to get it off with Dave kind of thing. Yeah, Which, it, was, it helped a couple issues. So one of them, you didn't know who you were trading off of, so that may matter to some people. And second, you didn't worry about the exact value of your game. You weren't worried about that my player's handbook's worth $50 and yours is only worth 20 So I also need a $30 item. It was, you know what? It's a board game. Board games are worth five tokens. Small box games are worth two tokens. And card games like Uno or whatever are worth one token. And you spend five tokens, you can get five card games. Or you spend five tokens, you get a board game. A board game's a board game. Say like a Ticket to Ride size box. Maybe you have the 10, or 10 token Eclipse phase or uh, Eclipse or... Twilight Imperium level or whatever, and like to RPGs, it was it was um, Splat Book Module Core Book was basically how we split it up, and so we didn't have to worry about the fact that the Pathfinder book's 900 pages long, and the well, we'll actually use Eclipse phase this time is only 300 pages, and their MSRPs are actually quite far apart. It was here's one hardcover rule book for another hardcover rule book. Worked out well. Yeah. Now speaking of cons and get-togethers and trading. One of the things that is the best, and I guess a, 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 probably the most efficient way to get rid of games, replacing them with games you want, is a math trade. Now, this is, uh, the basics here is that a group of people decide they all want to trade games. And they use a specific piece of software to create a list of all the games they're willing to trade away. And you just go in and you select them all. And it's tied to board game group. So you go in and you pick all the games you want to get rid of. You're like, here, here's all the stuff I'm willing to get rid of. And then once everyone's done that, there's like a certain time period for everyone to put in their games. Then everyone gets the list. And now it's a list of everything that everyone's put in the pile, we'll say. And you start going through and you're like, ooh, I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And I want that. And now there's an extra step where you go, well, you wanted this. What are you willing to trade for that? So you go back to your initial list and you do this little pairing off thing where it's like, well, yeah, I wanted a copy of that and I'm willing to give up this, 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 or this for that. And then you sit back and relax while everyone else does that. And then the moderator, whoever's running it, runs the software. Now, I honestly have no idea what goes into this back end. It's, it's math doing stuff in the background. But the end result is that you end up trading your stuff. So once the software does all its stuff, it's going to set up a ton of trades. And the interesting part is it'll be with a bunch of different people so that everyone gets stuff they want. 
So like, for example, I might trade something to Deanna, but end up getting something from Dave. Whereas Deanna is actually getting two things from Sean and Dave's getting something from Tom. But like, it all works. Like the, the software did the thing. I just, I give up the games I want and I get the games I wanted in return. It's the more complex version of the token system. In, in a way, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's where, the, where the tokens were a little more arbitrary in the math trade system. There, there's real values applied to Yeah, there's real values. Because you can literally say, like, I only want this game if I give up this for it. Mm -hmm. But the weird part is I might not get this game for that directly, right? That's where the math trade comes right. in. Like, Sean may have actually gotten this, and, and Sean might have given up three games to get that, but I end up getting something. Like, it's 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 funky. It's it's I've finally done one. I've now taken part. We only had about 12 people, so there wasn't a lot. But, like, you know what? I got rid of the three games, and I got two games I really want. And, and like I said, it's you get what you want. Like, you, you, you have complete control over what you let go and what you get in return. Without any bartering, there's no interaction with these people, which is, I got to say, at times an added bonus. No, absolutely, and, and sometimes that can be that can be the, the the real thing because you're avoiding, as long as you're upfront and 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 clear about everything, yes. you're avoiding a lot of that haggling hassle mm -hmm. that you you run into on your Kijijis and your Ebay's and your Facebook. People aren't haggling over prices; they aren't questioning about every little detail. It's mm -hmm. just they're looking for what they want. You're looking for what you want. And the software does the rest. You don't yep. have to. It doesn't matter whether Jane and Bob are idiots or yeah. you know whatever. It doesn't matter. They're going to get what they want. You're going to get what you want within the limits of the software. Now, the one thing I don't know about math trades is what you do when something goes wrong. Like I honestly have no idea. So I, I like it. I say I got the game and it was missing a piece. Like I don't even know whose game it was. So I don't know how that level of it works. You you would have to talk to like Hugh Ren, and I'd have to be like Hugh. This copy of this I got has no, so there's definitely an upfront level of trust required for people to have described the games to uh, in detail, right? So it goes back to being honest about what you have. Like that's the other thing, right? Like like be human, be nice. Don't try to rip people off. Like even when you're setting your prices, don't try to scam people. Don't this is this is like kind of off topic, but on topic. Don't say something's out of print that's not. Like, check. Make sure it's actually out of print. Don't claim something's, uh, you know, whatever signed or it's a first printing when it's not. Like, just don't scam people. <laughs> just just be honest about the actual condition. Don't try to tape something together because they won't notice. Don't glue. If you glue something back together, e indicate that too. Because glue bonds are usually not as strong as the original bond. Even though it might look like it's in perfect shape. Just be honest. Yep. Replacing components with second edition bits yes. is not cool. Yeah, if if you got replacement components, that's not cool. Yeah, no. And then once once you've decided to to make something happen, there's you're still not done, right? So yeah. if it's one thing if you're able to walk down to the uh, post office and throw it in there, uh, and then you have to deal with tracking and making sure that something gets there and dealing with insurance and if something gets lost, what happens? So there's all that. But even if you're doing something local you still have to take precautions and you need mm. to be aware. Uh, if you're selling something on Kijiji, for instance, you don't want a bunch of strangers knowing where you live, especially if you're selling collector's items. Yes. Uh, this is not safe. And while going to you know McDonald's may be a reasonable option because it's reasonably busy, no one at McDonald's cares if <laughs> someone is knifing you in the parking lot. Um, whereas... Uh, what's luckily been happening in more and more cities is the actual police offices, mm -hmm. uh, police stations have been opening up trading areas and saying, hey, look, do you have something you need to trade on Kijiji? Do you need to, you, you don't want to bring strangers to your house? Come down to the police station. We have this, you know, front lobby that's monitored by cameras with armed guards. <laughs> Stop on by and do your trade there. Because honestly, if the person you're trading with doesn't want to stop by the police station, maybe you don't want to be trading with them in the first place. Fair enough. <laughs> but but stick to stick to crowded locations like a McDonald's. Yeah. But but like a McDonald's at three o'clock in the afternoon, not a McDonald's yeah. at two o'clock in the morning. McDonald's um, not husky. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna you wanna make sure that you are in a crowded place where you can feel safe if it does turn into mm -hmm. a situation where the other person is becoming aggressive. For any reason. Yeah. No, very true. Be, be in a public place. Or go uh, even going, don't trust, go to their house. Yeah. Especially if they live in an apartment building. 
where you had to buzz in so that you're you're being removed from the public. Yeah, going to your your the, going going to someone else's house is no better than yeah, them, them coming I'm to your house. To <laughs> it's potentially worse. Like, yeah. If, in my opinion, if you're the one selling the game, you're probably straight up trying to sell the game. But yeah. like dropping something off at someone's house, you worry about leaving the game there and not getting anything in return. Yeah. My favorite is if you can do it at the FLGS, but I always feel weird about it, selling games at the FLGS, right? You're like, yeah, that's eh, don't buy their stuff, buy my used thing instead. But it is, I mean, from a safety point of view, it's great. Yeah, local game store is a great place to do it, but check with your store. So that's an important side note off that yep. is, is don't just assume that it's cool that you're going to sell your magic collection at the local game store when they're selling magic cards themselves. They may not be cool with that. Or they might be perfectly cool with it. Yeah. I, it depends. Depends on the store. But always ask with them. Um, the One of our local game stores does not encourage it all the time, but they set aside special events specifically for doing it. The best thing, though, is if your local store doesn't offer consignment, ask why. Um, because... Our local game store, the owner of it, did some research into it with a at a game convention at Gamma, um, talking to other stores and how much money they're making off consignments. And basically, he left with the impression of you're kind of dumb if you don't. Like it's just it's an untapped market, and game stores are having a hard time nowadays. Like I'm not even talking. We're pretending there's no pandemic tonight. <laughs> We'd have a whole different list of topics for meeting for with people and porch drops and right yeah. and. and <laughs> We're, we're going to ignore all that for tonight, thankfully. We'll just forget that's going on. But having consignments, just take, like, all the stores do is take a percentage, right? They give up a bit of their space. They take a percentage off the top. Uh, I don't know what that would be. Like, I'm not a store owner. I don't know what it would be. But, like, look at the prices eBay is charging and make it less than that, but not too crazy, right? And then they put aside in the spot in the store and they sell consignment games. Because they're still going to sell their shiny new copy. Because people are collectors and like shiny new copies. They're it just because there's a forty dollar copy of Root that's used there doesn't mean the seventy dollar new copy is not going to sell necessarily. You're actually selling to two different markets at that point. The person that's going to buy the forty dollar copy was never going to buy the seventy five dollar copy, and the person that's going to buy the seventy five dollar doesn't want that used copy someone else has touched. Like it's literally it's it's two different vectors, mm -hmm. and that's the way to think of it as a store owner. So like I said, if they don't, I would recommend it. The one here was supposed to launch it. That was actually yeah. what I plan to do with my, my growing pile of reviews, I review know. copies of games that I've, I've played and I don't necessarily feel like keeping, despite the fact of being pretty good games. Yeah, no, I, and, and I just make sure you're informed. Uh, in the chat room, they are talking about, you know, again, if you're doing a math trade, make sure you read the fine print. You yes. want to know what you're getting into. If you are going with consignment somewhere, Make sure up front you know who's setting the price, what mm -hmm. the percentages are, when payment is going to be due. Are they going to be paying you up front and they're going to handle the rest of it? Or are you not going to see a dime until they sell it? Uh, you know, that yeah. they're holding on to that material and you need to make sure that you know when it's getting sold. Um, yeah. and, and, and how much, how long after it gets sold will you be paid? I'm going to hop back for one. I mentioned about like using eBay as a source to set your price, but if you go on eBay and you decide, Hey, it regularly sells on eBay for like $120 us. And I'm going to sell it locally for $90 Canadian. Use that as a selling point. Tell people yeah, tell about people. your listing when you put it up. Yeah. If you, if you've done the research, let people know like, Hey, the, I, I, we do this constantly for our extra life auctions. We're like, all right, currently going on eBay for this much, right? Currently selling on Amazon for this much. Yep. No, absolutely. All right, so we talked about selling games, we talked about trading games, but there are alternatives to both of these options. When you don't necessarily want or need to get anything in return, and that's donating your games to a good cause. Yeah, you can donate your unwanted games to a local school, like grade schools would love to have games, even high schools or a library, um, or you could give them to your local FLGS or game cafe for their uh, in-store library. And that has the added bonus of if it's just a space issue, maybe you know you can still go there and play it. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you can also just give your games direct to local gamers, right? If you're, we talked about how you're doing your one and done, right? So one of the topics we talked about last week was before you get rid of a game that's been sitting on your shelf forever and you haven't played it in forever, give it one more play. If you play that one more play and there's four of you playing and 
you're like, eh, yeah, I don't need to keep this. But one of the other players is like, damn, I really like this game. Just give it to him. Here you go. Have this game. We're done with it. We've had enough. You seem to have fun with it. Or people who are just starting off in the hobby or just getting into their collections. I do a lot of public play events where I get new gamers out. And, like, I wish I had a couple extra copies of Gokuko around. Like, it's a cheap enough game that, like, some people get so hyped. I'd, be, I'd love to be able to be like, here, just take a copy. Go home. Right? Like, the... the or even in all these Facebook groups and stuff like that, right? Like just the whole um, play it forward kind of thing. Like put it up for sale and you don't get anyone for a while. And then someone gets a hold of you finally. And they're like, oh, I'm really excited. This. So you're like, you know what? I've had that up for a month. You can just have it, right? It's going to go to, especially if someone's excited, right? Because to me, that's a good thing to do because the person is going to a gamer. They're going to play the game. Yep. Now, another option is to donate them to a charity. Um, there's the Salvation Army, there's May Court, there's um, Goodwill and all that. Uh, for one thing, you're going to end up making someone really happy when they ha take a picture of it and share it on Facebook to their Goodwill find. Um, other than that, like that's generally not what I would do, but it is an option. To me, that's better than throwing it out. Probably better than throwing it in a yard sale and getting a buck. Mm -hmm. Like You might as well drop it off at some, you know, your Value Village or whatever your local uh, charity or resale shop is. Or you can upcycle it and turn it into something else because uh, that was one of the suggestions last week when we were talking yep. about purging games. Someone in the chat room has suggested turning it into wall art, which is a very cool idea. Yep. Or we have locally Extra Life Auctions. You might have something similar local to you and that's a really cool way to get rid of your games and know that it's going to a good cause and, and still staying local probably and going to be out maybe at public play events and in the community. So, you know, it's cool. We have a lot of generous local gamers that will yeah. donate items every year for Extra Life. And we raise thousands of dollars that way. So it's pretty cool. And yeah, uh, so another, anyone who sorry, another great comment in the uh, chat room is donate to a local gamer design club if there is one. Uh, so that they can use those parts and turn them into the next great board game. No, it makes perfect cool sense. Idea. Yeah, and for those who don't know what Extra Life is, it's a 24-hour gaming charity that raises money for the Children's Miracle Network Hospital. Uh, the goal is to game for 24 hours. It's uh, always around November every year. Gamers the world over take participate. It's something we participated in for uh, 10 years now, I think. I don't even know. It might be 11. And we've raised like over $15,000 US doing that. And a big part of that are extra life auctions, which does lead me to auctions in general. This is something you can do. I've seen people do them online. I've seen people do them in Facebook. I've seen people do them at local events. You can also auction off your game. Now, what's cool about auctions is you get that bidding war, right? You get that chance that you're like, hey, you know what? I got a copy of Roots, 20 bucks. Anyone want it? And they're like, yeah, I'll buy it for 20. Oh, I want 25, I want 30. And it keeps going up and it ends up you can make some really good money off it. Now, again, if you're going to do this at a local game store, make sure you ask. This was something else that our local game store was hoping to do more often during the year than they do now. And plus, we ran one for Geekropolis we did. Um, unfortunately, because a gamer had passed away and we were getting rid of his game collection that managed to raise enough money to basically open a game store. And auctions can be a great way to get great money for your stuff or sell it all dirt cheap. So you really got to watch it with auctions. It depends on your crowd. If your crowd's got some big spenders in it, you'll do awesome. But a lot of people go to auctions to look for deals. So to me, they're very hit and miss and they are very stressful and a lot of work. Like I think more so than having to deal with the idiot on eBay that you've been talking to a million times and you ship him the package and he says he didn't get it. And like that's simple compared to managing an auction. Yeah, and then use all this information to set your prices, your opening prices for your auction. And you give them all that info on what's missing, what's in the box, all that stuff. You be upfront about it. You don't want people handing it back to you next week. Yeah. Yeah, no, the auctions the auctions are tough. Uh, and especially depends on the crowd you, you get to your auction. There, there, there are two mm -hmm. different kinds of charity auctions. Uh, and I've experienced both in, in various uh, formats. Um, I mean, if you go to, you know, a big name charity auction where the point of the event is the charity Mm -hmm. then you get People's people time. oftentimes who are there to spend money. They come, it's much like a casino in that way, right? Mm -hmm. They are coming there with $500 and they are going to leave with $0. And that is the goal. They mm -hmm. may leave with something as well, but they are there to spend money for the charity and give to the, to the, mm -hmm. you know, the charity and the, and the cause. Uh, whereas in a lot of these other auctions, you know, in, in some of the things like sometimes extra life, uh, you've got gamers there who are there to play games and look for deals mm -hmm. and they don't have $500 to spare. 
They yeah. have, you know, $40 that they'd really like to stretch out and, and get yeah. the most for. It's, and, it's $40 for their whole entire weekend that's got to cover food, gaming, and coffee. Right. right? And so, my, so they're looking for the deal. Yeah. I was going to say my tip for running is to try and have that mix of the rare high value items and the bottom dollar deals so that, you know, you can get a good mix. And yeah. Like we'll, we'll, we'll toss in like gamer keychains and Pokemon and things like that yeah. and yeah. Uh, promo cards and like, you know, $5 items. So for the people, it's not much money. And I can say, all right, we usually get both. We'll get people there with uh, the money in their pocket. They're there to spend. And we'll get the people there that who didn't show up with any money, even though it's a charity event. Yeah. And, and you really have to sort of balance it and, and hope that you get enough of the people who have the money to spend to make mm -hmm. the, the a massive amount of time and effort you've put into the pricing and yep. the, the, the labeling and the organizing of it, um, you know, worthwhile for the charity because you're not getting anything out of it. <laughs> it's yeah, like, if it's donated, you, you are donating your time as well. Yeah. Running a charity auction is a topic in and of itself. Yeah, true. Yeah, fact, well. If anyone wants to hear us cover <laughs> running a charity auction, send your questions to questions at tabletoplop.com. We'll throw it on the list. All right, well, that's it for our discussion on the best ways to get rid of your unwanted games. We're going to head over to the lobby now to see what the mm -hmm. awesome folk gathered here have been talking about while we were talking. All right, so what I want to see here is uh, what have people done? What have they done? What do their local stores offer? What, what kind of things have people done to get rid of games? So uh, Pennywise in the chat was mentioning that they would load up bags full of games and go to a place about three and a half hours away because they could get store credit uh, and use that to buy newer games to try yeah. out. No, totally legit. You know, if, you can, if you can get the store credit, and a lot of places yeah. are going to offer you a better rate for store credit than they would if they were just giving you cash to walk away. Yes. Yeah, no, actually, that's a really good tip when you're selling anything anywhere like like i i sold i i kind of regret it now because we probably could have done a better deal but at one point i had an expensive toy collection because i was a spoiled brat and selling that actually paid for my gaming hobby for many years and i would go to a place called the classic comic and card center in livonia michigan and i would give them one transformer and walk out with booster boxes of ccgs usually a spawn action figure because for some reason i was trading my toys for more toys which I don't quite understand that one now, and like an RPG rule book. And like, like I, I, I think I tried every CCG that came out in the 90s because of selling them this stuff because I started running out of things to buy. I'm like, I have everything I want, but I'll get more for store credit. So how much, how about you give me all the Battletech uh, Mech Warrior collectible card game boxes you've got for this copy of uh, Rodimus Prime? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. So it's definitely worth asking for store credit. Even the local store does give more for store credit, whether that's for cards or anything else. No, yeah, absolutely. That's a real lot. Um, now, Pennywise also saying you've been using for, uh, Facebook board game groups to sell on yeah. Facebook. Uh, not, not to sell, but only to buy. So there's mm -hmm. always an option to use it to sell more games if he sells more. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. Facebook groups have worked out really well uh, so far. The, the thing, too, is like Windsor's not that big. And there are two main local game stores, well, three now, I guess. There's three local game stores now. I forgot about that. We have three local game stores now. And it's the same people that go to all of them, right? So it's most of the time I know the people that are in the groups, which is an added bonus. The disadvantage is that they know me, and I have a reputation now where no one wants to buy my games because they're like, why is Mo selling it? It must be bad. And I'm like, no, I have like a thousand games. They're not bad. I just have better ones. <laughs> and they don't quite always get Only that. so much space. Which is one of the reasons I actually wanted the store to do local consignment because I didn't want my name on the box because people wouldn't know they were coming from me. So they wouldn't be like, well, Mo doesn't like it. What's wrong with it? No, it's not a, everyone it's, has the same taste as me. It's a real problem, uh, you know, when especially when you have uh, a reputation of any sort. I mean, it could yeah. be a good reputation or a bad reputation. A reputation is going to color the pricing, period. Yes. Uh, one way up, down, left, right, uh, prevent it completely. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just, it's something that's going to affect you. So if you can use the store to essentially anonymize those transactions, yeah. uh, it's, it, makes it, it makes life easier that way. Uh, Ryan was commenting while well, we were talking about uh, yard sales. You know, everyone mm -hmm. wants to be the one to discover the treasure and pay nothing for it oh, at yeah. the yard sale. That's what uh, that's, that's what yard selling is all about. It's that, an that is what it's all about. Uh, so, so like I said I will admit, if you are going to try a yard sale, you can get away by having one table. We'll say 
of highly priced items that people seem to tolerate. You'll still get some people in your face about even doing that, but you can tend to get away with that, but don't mix it in with everything else and don't try to only sell collectibles and watch it. <laughs> watch yes. it like a hawk. Yes. Put, put that your cat, make that your cash box. Well, the other thing too is like we, we were selling collectible toys at the time, parents letting their kids play with everything. We're like, no, that's a $300 transformer. Don't let your six-year-old put it in their mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah no, there's there, there's a lot of problems with yard sales. Yeah. They, yeah. Our overall suggestion is don't, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like, unless you don't care. Like I said, instead of throwing it in the trash, you had that flood, you got that hungry, hungry hippos with no you marbles left. literally want $2 a game, and that's better than nothing, and yeah. there if you, you go. If you get to that point, <laughs> yeah. feel free. Even uh, then, though, I'd almost say donate. I know. Cause yeah, the, the only them. my only critique with donating would be do pay attention to the charities. Uh, you know, charities yeah. have different uh, ways of, of doing business, and they those may or may not uh, coincide with how your your feelings on things. Yeah. So just make sure you know what's yeah, happening and who's charity. who's being benefited and and all that. Uh, you know, before you you pick where you want those games to go to. Yeah. Uh, the library is safe, but uh, you know if if there's a a storefront run by some organization do your you know do your due diligence yeah, to make sure your you're okay diligence. with that find out where the money goes yeah. find out what they support uh ryan support. ryan has now pr participated in first and second math trades in the oh, past nice. week so he's well, i guess uh, it, he's math trades are that. definitely worth it um so one of the things i did notice he mentioned I don't think I see us here. There are two types. So there are ship math trades and no ship math trades. You generally want to do the no ship because you have no clue where you're going to send this stuff. That's the thing with a math trade. You, you're you like, I got six games from one person, so I only have to ship to one person. No, your six games are going to six different people, right? Like that's yeah. how part of how math trades work. Yeah, I and, actually... and there's nothing good about shipping. <laughs> yes, there is shipping nothing is just good insane. about shipping. I actually worked at a library for years, and I have feelings about library donations because they don't necessarily always go where you intend them to go. So I feel like if you really want your board games to be at that library, maybe talk to a librarian or someone that works there. Don't just drop off a giant box and assume they're going to keep them. They may just go home with staff or in, end up in the rummage sale. And if yep. that's going to hurt your heart, don't do it. Yep. No, absolutely. That that's a valid. Yeah, you, whatever you're doing, you don't necessarily just want to show up randomly with a box of stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, no matter who you're giving it away to, even if it's mm -hmm. even if you're donating it to the local grade school, and you think, oh, they're gonna love this. Well, call them and check first, um, because maybe there's some reason they can't. Maybe you know there are all sorts of strange rules and regulations even in non-pandemic times. So mm -hmm. if you're gonna donate something. Uh, you know, unless they unless they've got a big sign up saying "drop your stuff here," big call. All right, we got a bunch more stuff from Ryan. You want to just fire through these? Sure. Ryan Ryan had a, a list of stuff that he's been uh, yeah, which of, awesome. of different things he's done. So he's given boxes of games to family to get them into the hobby. Yeah, that's which an is awesome. Think, you know, again, that's the, the pass it pass it on, pass it forward, extend the mm -hmm. hobby. Uh, ship box of games to a game store for credit. Again, we know store credit no. hard to beat. I know uh, Cool Stuff Inc. actually in the U.S. buys games and cards where you just mail them to them, and then they give you store credit. And they are some of the best prices online for shopping. We have a, one of the local gamers, Will Chamberlain, is usually in the chat. He's not in there tonight. Uh, that's how he pays for his board game hobby was he got rid of his magic collection to Cool Stuff. And he had a significant enough collection that the last time I talked to Jamie, he still hasn't paid for a game because he had that much magic credit. Like, he played seriously. He played tournaments. He had moxes. Was that where it was through? Was yeah, it was CSI. Yeah. Cool stuff. He had and, sent and it it's all to the US. You know, I'm surprised there's not more of that, because I know with, like, electronics, there's a few different organizations where you send them their, like, your, your used electronics, and they give you yeah. uh, credit, credit, and you can yeah. buy, buy new electronics and stuff that way. Uh, not so much in Canada, but in the States especially. There's a few different groups um, that were heavily advertising on podcasts for a while, which is how I know about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was just, you know, they'll send you a, they'll send you a, an envelope and you send them your, you send it to them. Like you, even the shipping was easy on, in, uh, for that so, sort of stuff. Right. Uh, he also, he sold games in the game market at Calgary convention. Again, we, we yeah. going to conventions cons. seem uh, to have all, every convention I've been to had something. Yep. Some sort of, some sort of little, you know, either, mm -hmm. either trade or sale or, or a way to get things. Yeah. Uh, again, he's, he's done a couple of math trades, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, Sold games at bring and buy auction at a local convention. Yeah. That's a fantastic thing. Another another great way that conventions can can help out. 
uh, and give games to the local game society library. Yeah, you know? if you've got a local gaming club that has a library, that is a great place to donate. Because games. you'll still be able to play it if you want exactly. to. Exactly. But so will anybody else who yeah. wants to, to to get involved there. Uh, it's traded unopened game for unopened games at stores. Great. That's a good one to do if you get a gift. Yep. No, absolutely. You, you get you, a gift. You know, you know, post Christmas. You know, June <laughs> thinks that Harry Potter Funko verse is really cute, but you're really into Warhammer 40K. You might be able to turn uh, Voldemort into some Terminators. And he mentions he tried to sell some games on Kijiji without success, though there was some interest. Well, I think yeah, that's sort of the definition of Kijiji. Yeah. Uh, not much success, <laughs> but a lot of interest. <laughs> we, we've successfully done it a couple times, but yeah, Kijiji I bought more than I sold. Yeah, I, I've, I've done a couple of uh, purchases on Kijiji, and honestly, they have all felt really dirty and sketchy almost every yeah, time. Yeah, I got, yeah, some of, some of the, <laughs> I, I've gotten video game system stuff so i've gotten yeah, controllers, controllers and retro systems what and, and the, 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 for a while i was getting xbox controllers like that i i don't know where they came from well i mean i i, I picked ask. up i picked up those games for you um you did that yes you, you did that one thing and it's this house that um seems to probably actually not be occupied as a house but well, it's full yeah. of product um and there happened well, to be that some one games. was legit <laughs> that, that that had to do with uh, someone's parents passing yeah. away and but but there's a few like of those that, where yes. i've been to it's where you you stop by and i mean i'm a big guy so i'm not as careful as i recommend yeah. other people should be uh but you stop by the house and it's sort of like oh your this this house is just a front for people selling things mm. that may well have fallen off a truck yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, this no one is living in this domicile. style uh, but uh, yeah, and then he uh, he sold a box of BattleTech CCG cards to someone in the U.S. for the cost of shipping. Yeah, <laughs> I've done that. Yeah, I bought something like I I shipped that once. I'm like, anyone want this? I'll do. You just gotta pay shipping. And I've gotten games that way too. Um, that went back in the G Plus days. That actually was relatively common. But because it was common, more people did it. Right. Right. It wasn't one of those pay it forward things. Although shipping these days is not something you get, it's only yeah, but it's right the buyers now. paying it. Yeah, yeah, but no, but I mean, right, like particularly right now during yeah. the, we aren't talking about pandemic generally, but in the pandemic times, shipping yeah. is no, ugly. No shipping, um, thank you. I, I, I literally Although we're going to ship stuff in three weeks. I, uh, I got, I got, I got something for my son's birthday recently, uh, and it shipped in the from Canada Post from literally forty minutes down the road. I could have driven there and back and back, probably there and back in under an hour and it took eight days to get to my house <laughs> from the time canada post picked wow. it up to the time they put it in my mailbox eight days um so it's a it's an interesting time we're living in right now that's in the last thing ryan notes is starlight citadel which is a store that took games for credit is closed i didn't know that that's a store i know of their, their prices weren't great for buying but it was one of the few places you could buy used games online in canada right all right I think we're pretty good here. Um, one last note. If you're selling RPGs, another one is half price books. Half price books in the States is great for buying RPGs or in, in box sets and stuff like that. They may or may not buy board games depending on your local store. I've heard both. Most people say they do not do board games because they're too worried about missing components. But books from RPGs, they seem to be more than willing to buy. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. And Abe is Abe a books. great source for pricing. And you yes. can sell on there too, but... It, you have to have a, a large quantity to be able to be selling on there. So. Yeah, so Abe Books is an aggregate that aggregates prices from local book uh, from um, independent bookstores mm -hmm. that um, yep. do used. Sorry, not like no chapters Indigo, but um, used bookstores, and they aggregate. So it's a, especially for RPGs, a good way to find prices. They you can sometimes find a board game on there, but I find the board games tend to be no, the board games ridiculous. are ridiculous. They shouldn't <laughs> yeah. be listed. On like they shouldn't be listed, and, and they're like three hundred dollars each. RPGs. Right. But yeah. yeah, RPGs, definitely Abe Books, A-B-E dot com, I think. Yep. Excellent. Well, that's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at bell tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Gaming Advice at the top of the page. We also want to thank Deanna for joining us for this segment of the show and sharing her expertise on the topic. Now, finally, as usual, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do Go over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send me an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 